Well, this is a real treat today. I'm joined by uh, Mr. Peter Chan from Heron's Bonsai. And uh, it, this was the longest of long shots for me to ask Peter to join this conversation because he does not consider himself an educator in the traditional classroom sense. But as I just told him before we begin, he has taught more students than any educator I have ever or will ever meet because uh, he has this YouTube series that uh, I have found along with 42 million other viewers and bonsai is one of my hobbies. I would like to say it's a passion, but it's my skill set is certainly developing, but you have been a teacher for me. And one of the unique things about your YouTube series is you don't charge for it. Uh, you constantly produce videos and you have a really, um, I think, influential way in a very positive way of delivering your message. So welcome to the conversation. It's very, it's truly an honor to meet you sort of in person. Good. Thank you very much, Jed. Um, and one thing I've learned already about Peter, whether viewing him or now speaking with him a bit, is he is humble, but I'm going to brag about him a little when I read this bio. So, uh, and this is the, one of the words I found in a bio is no accident. Peter Chan is the doyen of bonsai in the UK and well known for his record tally of 21 Chelsea Flower Show gold medals, which is a feat no other bonsai specialist has ever achieved. Now that word doyen, that is no accident and no that's no small word it literally the the definition is the most respected and prominent individual in a particular field doesn't mean the best it's not a bragging term um but that most prominent and respected we're going to come back to that um and when that word is associated with you that's quite a message and when that work is your passion it shows in everything you do plus i've seen at least two pictures of you with her majesty the queen and not many people can say that uh, many throughout, I'm going to read this little bio here because it's a great way of introducing you to people who may be expecting only other colleagues and teachers in this conversation. Many throughout the world have been inspired to take up bonsai as a hobby after reading one or more of his nine best-selling books, seeing his TV appearances, or more likely discovering his wildly popular YouTube series in recent years. He's also a graduate from the prestigious Indian Institute of Technology, where he uh, you were an electrical engineer and then moved to the UK as a senior administrator and speechwriter. I am fascinated how all these pieces fit together in your story. And then it was through those speeches and talking about privatization and entrepreneurship that he was inspired to set up his own business, which is Heron's Bonsai. So again, welcome to the conversation. Very pleased to meet you. Okay, so where shall we begin? We shall begin by talking about this YouTube channel and the series of videos that you have had 42 million viewers and what gave you the idea to do this? Because you don't have to, you have a successful nursery, you are a highly regarded author. You don't have to give away your secrets for free. What is it about you and your background that brought you to create this? Well, YouTube, like the founders of YouTube, which were these two young guys from San Diego. They just went to San Diego Zoo and they did a short video of the elephants in the zoo. And that's how it started. So my uh, entry into YouTube is very similar to that. I just did it uh, purely by accident. I had a young apprentice who was learning to uh, do digital marketing for me. And he said, hey, why don't you do some YouTube videos and see how it goes. So the very first YouTube video is still on my site, which was only like half a minute of two minutes. And it, it was a very rudimentary one. And that's how it started. And then we found that uh, it was getting quite uh, noticed. Uh, and before I knew where I was getting, some other entrepreneurs, mainly from the United States, could see what I was doing and I wasn't charging for it. So they approached me, why don't we get into collaboration and we could make you a fortune, you know, you sell it to us and we'll sell it to other people. But I didn't go down that route. So my YouTube, I uh, deliberately kept it free so that it is free for everyone to see. Uh, I know I get some income from the YouTube viewings and the advertising, but that is not the main purpose of the thing. My main purpose in sharing my videos is to spread knowledge because I feel that knowledge is a human birthright, which everyone has a right to enjoy. That's, that's no small statement. I mean, that's profound. It speaks to your work, your mission, and that 
translates across bonsai about art about teaching i mean it's purely uh that's a mission statement for any educator whatever the medium happens to be um and it's interesting because yes you did kind of find it by accident and i wonder if you hadn't i wonder if that you know that apprentice hadn't suggested it or if you had turned away there's a quote that i found where you talked about it says after all these decades of bonsai making i was learning losing interest i was set in a routine the goal of which was to sell trees. What helped me overcome this rut was shifting priorities and objectives. Now that's good advice for any teacher, anyone who is developing their craft. You're, it says, my love for bonsai never wavered, but doing it solely for the business became troublesome. It wasn't until I discovered YouTube and started talking to my audience that I unearthed a new drive, a desire to teach and help others on a much larger scale. When I read that, that's what this whole book and project is all about. It's scaling that, amplifying that voice. And so many people have found individuals along the way who have found ways to either give them opportunities, give them voice for you. It was just this literally pressing record and making yourself available. So seeing how far and with which impact your experience could reach, you said that you felt uh, a new bout of energy in your work. And it's a blessing because you can maintain and even grow in your bonsai practice. So I want to thank you on behalf of your audience because it's great that it's free. People would pay for it. And that's, but it's really powerful that that's not what it's about and that you have a very successful nursery. You have um, your books and, and this is your livelihood, but it's also your passion. What do you think it is about you and your personality and your background as an electrical engineer that pushed you to just try these things and keep sharing and demonstrate at shows. And, and like you said, it's that giving that knowledge out and sharing that knowledge. I've heard you say no one has a monopoly on it. Right. I enjoy what I do. And of course, like many things in life, there are certain situations and circumstances and experiences that cannot find a logical explanation. Call it what you will. It could be divine intervention or whatever. I don't like to bring religious significance into this discussion, but many things happen in life, which you may consider to be things that happen by accident or chance, but they have on uh, reflection or when you look back in retrospect that there was a purpose for that thing happening. And I believe this was such uh, a situation where it was almost like a divine in intervention that it came to me. And then I was able to um, help both myself and the audience from that. So had it not happened, you know, I may have stumbled across it later on in life, but the fact that it happened in that way, I'm eternally grateful for, because in life there are many things that happen by chance. I don't like to word, use the word by chance or luck, although I do believe in luck to a certain extent. Much of life, you say that you're lucky or someone is lucky. We all get luck, but it's what you do with the luck that matters. There's another expression which says you make your own luck. The luck can come your way, but you don't notice and you don't grasp it. So it's lost forever. So I would say that this is, um, something that happened by chance and I was able to seize upon it and make the best of it. So I wouldn't say it's entirely due to me. I think there is some, you know, a, a more <laughs> powerful element of power that intervened and introduced me to that. I hope you get the feeling of what I'm trying to convey. I do. And many it's... of the that we do, we try to be very proud and say, oh, I did it, or it was all due to me. I don't say that. I'm just grateful that these things happen and uh, you're able to make use of it in that way. I think that's great. And you, there is a humility to you because you are also are incredibly skilled. You are at the top of your craft. And that along with luck and opportunity, and whether it is divine intervention, whether it's other philosophical means that you share all of that, you it just comes through you. And when someone watches you 
working with a tree. They see your relationship with nature. They see your relationship with the tree. And one of my favorite things is there's no doubt how seriously you take your craft and the art and the history, but you don't take yourself as seriously. You wear fun shirts, you wear a silly hat, and you'll, you'll clip a branch off and say, well, maybe sometimes we need to break the rules or bend the rules or challenge conventional thought without doing so in a way that uh, in any way demeans or, or insults tradition, especially a tradition which has thousands of years of history and craft and art behind it. But like I said, you don't take yourself seriously. You'll take a tree more seriously than you'll take yourself. You're not selling trees or pots or tools. I've heard you say so many times, a good pair of scissors is really, you know, you can buy high-end tools, but if you have the right clippers and scissors, you can achieve these results. And before I pressed record, I asked a critical question about <laughs> a maple tree of mine. And Peter said to me, you're not gonna kill it, go ahead, try it, of course you can do it. And it's, there is, you encourage people with that. And it's, like I said, you take your work and your craft seriously, which has brought you I think those opportunities, it has what maybe you can call it making luck, but it's a lot more than just being in the right place at the right time. So I guess a question I would ask is, what if someone is feeling, whether it's a teacher, someone who is maybe stuck in their particular role and wants to reach an audience, whether it's YouTube, maybe it's teaching something they have to share, because you clearly have not just the skill set for bonsai and the artistry and literally the the skill honed years and years of bonsai artisanship but you also have that ability to teach very well and whether it's workshops at the nursery or these youtube series how would you encourage someone else who's beginning to feel like okay i've done something for 10 years maybe it's in the classroom maybe it's a different skill and they want to begin to turn around from that impacting a small group to influencing a large group what advice might you give them well, there are many factors. I think, first of all, you've got to be uh, humble, really. You know, many people who go to teach and consider themselves masters in their art, uh, they have very inflated ideas of their own worth. And that uh, is, I think, the wrong place to begin. You've got to be humble and say that I have something to share. So let's start from the very beginning, put yourself in the student's shoes, you know, what are they wanting to learn? And then start from that very low level. Don't consider yourself a great master. Just think of yourself as someone who is sharing something that you can do. Um, I don't consider myself a great bonsai master. I'm not a great carver and all these great artists. There are many more finer teachers and craftsmen than me, but I'm able to con communicate the simple aspects of bonsai, which encourage people to get into the hobby. So it is really a very basic level. I believe that a student should excel the master at some stage. And that doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. A lot of people are afraid of that. I've noticed it. Many of the masters will go so far. Once they realize that you're learning more than them, they stop telling you anything. And that's very <laughs> yeah, for sure. Too. Yeah, it's not a good thing. So I think you have to be humble and say that, you know, you've got to be prepared to uh, guide a person through and lead them through greater things. Uh, and of course, you've got to know your subject and basic things like learning how to communicate, because there are so many things you can learn in this digital age. You can learn almost anything from the digital world. So learn how to communicate. There are ways to learn it and uh, do it that way. If you can't speak properly or a bit nervous, there are ways to teach you how to overcome your nervousness, to take it slowly, speak one sentence at a time. Uh, simple things like that help. Uh, so as we say, it's not rocket science. It can be taught, it can be learned, but the mindset should be there. And I think what is most important is that you should be in the mindset where you're really serving other people, you know, the teacher is like a servant, you know, you're there to serve others, not to dominate them or do anything like that. And once you get into that uh, mindset, your students will 
appreciate it. I don't like to say respect you, but maybe they will appreciate and they will be able to uh, uh, empathize with you. Um, so those are just simple, very basic things that I like to pass on. That's great advice. I mean, whether someone has been teaching for 20 or 30 years or in a particular role and maybe thinking about shifting roles. And that also speaks to being a lifelong learner as well. An educator, an educator should always be learning. And you model that. Um, the most recent video I watched from you was this crazy heat wave that we've been in the middle of. And you've had to find solutions on your nursery to deal with 100 degree heats in the middle of the summer for a prolonged period of time. And it was very interesting the way you explained, maybe just it might be risk taking, but it might be experimentation. And you talked about um, always thinking of finding new rules um, and trying to always be solution oriented. And I, that connects with this idea of being the teacher being the servant, but the teacher is also modeling that lifelong learning. So I guess that leads to a question of wh where do you look for inspiration? I know that you learn from you learn from the trees because there's constant maintenance that has to happen, especially at the scale of materials you have, but you're always learning things and finding out things that work, things that don't. Where do you also learn technique or even look for inspiration yourself? Well, being from the engineering background, when you're always trying to find solutions, that I think helps because that is how my mind works. I have employees on uh, my nursery and I don't like to say it. Whenever I ask them to do something or present them with a problem, their first reaction is that they can't be done. It's very common thing. It can't be done. Maybe because they're lazy, but I don't know why. <laughs> Whereas I always look on it as how can we get it done? And this, I think, is how an engineer or a scientific person will always uh, tackle a problem. How can it be done? Finding the solution, not why it cannot be done. So that, I think, helps. Uh, I think if we look back to my very young days, I don't want to dwell on uh, the past or bring the sob story element into it. I wasn't born into a rich family. In fact, my grandfather, although he was the entrepreneur and he was able to send my father to the USA, my father studied in the Milwaukee School of Engineering, Electrical Engineering, 1928 to 1932. But uh, he didn't get into the family business and he died when I was six and a half years old. Oh, wow. And my, my mother was left a widow looking after four daughters and myself, five children with very little uh, means of um, support. So we grew up not penniless, but in very difficult circumstances. So trying to be frugal, trying to be um, uh, thrifty is all part of my upbringing, which I still practice to this very day. I never waste anything from my videos. You realize I don't waste wire, recycle wire, things like that, I think help you in later life. So all these things, the totality of it helps to shape your life and the way you approach life generally. Um, so this is my approach to bonsai, where I use simple, cheap things. You don't have to be a millionaire to spend lots of money. You can make things, uh, make bonsai from simple things. And that applies to virtually any field. You can find a solution. The simplest solution are the most elegant. It don't have to be the most expensive or the, uh, the most flamboyant. So that pervades my entire approach to life. I don't know whether that helps you or not. It, it helps quite a bit because I see it in your videos. It's different from other, whether it's commercial workshops or nurseries, where you'll, yeah, you'll just reach into a pile of used wire and unwire, unwind and wire again. Or whenever you clip a branch, it goes into a separate pile because you're going to propagate from that. And all those subtle things, I think your audience watches that and picks up on that because it's a respect as well. It's a respect for materials. It does not feel like your work is commercial in nature. And the first thing when you talked about being frugal, the first thing I thought of is 
when you clip off a branch, even if it's, you know, little maple shoots, I know those are going to be rooted and that will build your stock. And when you share that, it's pretty interesting to watch because that encourages your viewers like myself to go, you know, trim up a tree, but save all the materials or try wiring. And I've had more, well, no, I've had more failure than success with my experiments, but you've encouraged me to try it with all these things. And so if you take 20 cuttings and maybe six of them root, great, no, no loss. But uh, you, you've encouraged a lot of people, millions, literally around the world. And, and you know, it. and it's, it's fascinating because people come from around the world to meet you. Um, so for me, like I said, this was a long shot. Before we wrap up, I'll just ask you one silly question, which is almost embarrassing to ask you. But if you were to get a tattoo this afternoon and your tattoo read right across your arm, um, rule breaker, risk taker, or change maker, which do you think it might be? It, by the way, I'll show you. I have a nice uh, bonsai tattoo. <laughs> there it is with five five birds up top because that's my family of my uh, ourselves and our three kids. So, but I don't have one that says risk taker, rule breaker, or change maker. Which might you consider yourself? I think I would prefer change maker. Although I do break rules, I don't do that in an arrogant sort of way. Um, to break the rule is to get a pleasing end result. So I think to make a change to the world or make a change to someone's life is more important than to just say, I'm a rule breaker. Because a rule breaker sounds a bit arrogant, you know, or oh, I'm breaking the rule just to break the rule. The, so that is what I would prefer. I like that. That makes sense. And I've I've heard you talk about breaking the rules in a non-arrogant sort of way. When someone brings a tree to you, one of the things you'll say is some people would look at that branch and say that doesn't belong there, but that's what makes that tree unique. So in that sense, breaking the rules is accepting something for what it is and maybe challenging a traditional thought because it's not out of arrogance, it's actually to appreciate the individuality of, of a circumstance. So um, Mr. Peter Chan, it's been an absolute pleasure. I, I really appreciate the time. And I know that the readers and viewers of this project will take inspiration from you as well. Okay, thank you, Jen, for interviewing me. I enjoyed My that pleasure. immensely.